Ja, also ähm, doch, das ist doch das Richtige. Ähm, also wir machen weiter mit, äh, wie angekündigt, mit äh, dem Vortrag von John Barker, dann gefolgt von äh, zwei weiteren Beiträgen, einmal von Marion von Osten und dann von Mona Mahal und Asli Serbest. Und äh, werden dann im Anschluss äh, nochmal ein Panel eröffnen, um bestimmte Sachen, die ähm, diskutiert wurden, nochmal vertiefen zu können. Ich freue mich, Ihnen kurz John Barker vorstellen zu dürfen. John Barker ist Künstler und Autor, der in London und Wien äh, lebt. Er hat ähm, äh, Publikationen veröffentlicht wie Bending the Bars, Futures oder Criminal Justice Acts. Er beschäftigt sich theoretisch, ähm, könnte man das vielleicht fassen, mit dem Begriff der ökonomischen Philosophie, aber es geht natürlich auch sehr weit darüber hinaus. Ähm, er hat an Künstlerisch äh, arbeitet er vor allem in, im Bereich des Films und der Performance und äh, auch als Schauspieler, wie ich immer sagen würde. Er hat unter anderem äh, gemeinsame Projekte realisiert mit Ines Dujak äh, oder mit Laszlo Wanska, wie hier in dieser Ausstellung. Also diese Arbeit, die Sie dort sehen, äh, ist von den beiden extra für diese Ausstellung produziert worden. Ähm, und ähm, der Vortrag heute knüpft auch an äh, an dieses Werk an. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to thank Iris, whose lunchtime I ruined by, <laughs> in order to find this image, which she has kindly put up. Thank you, Iris. Uh, in, in the film that, that Iris has just mentioned, Consequenzen or Consequences, which you can see here, I hope you have seen it, which I made with Laszlo Vanksha. Uh, we focused on the historical contexts and direct links of the Bauhaus with the Deutsche Werkbund and its incontinent concern with design for exports, and then with the Social Democrats of the Weimar Republic, involving a shared denial of class conflict and how this was to be techno-circumvented by scientific management which in reality weakened the position of the working class in the process of production. A historical conjuncture in 1923 talked of in the film saw a change in Bauhaus ideology, whereby skill for the majority was only required to the extent that it served production processes designed by professionals, engineers, designers, and in prefabricated building by architects. The emphasis was to be on task, not skill, and the division of labor between design and its execution enforced and reinforced in the world of work. A measure of Bauhaus's immersion into the capitalist industrial world is indicated by an exhibition at the Tate Gallery in London in 2006, showing the work of Joseph Albers and Mahola Nagy, which was sponsored by BMW. Its marketing director explaining that the teachings of the Bauhaus School were of great influence during the first years of the company. Now, in fact, uh, BMW does not figure in the story I'm about to tell but the corporate names Bosch, Siemens, and Bayer will come in and out of the story. Weimar, National Socialism, War, Cold War came and went, but these pillars of corporate capital sail on and still do, <coughs> uh, despite some uh, ups and downs, it's these corporate uh, capitals, these corporate brand names that survive. I should apologize for being a non-German speaker, which limits how I want to develop the ideas shown in the film. But I do think I have something to add on the very issue of power and the competing strands of scientific management in the Weimar Republic. In the context of this exhibition, of the relationship between the Bauhaus exhibition of 1968 and its timing in relation to events in France. 
I think what I'm about to say is especially important because what was truly radical in France in 1968 was specifically opposition to managerialism by both the working class, the French working class, and with theoretical backing from the group Socialisme ou Barbarisme, uh, Henri Lefebvre, and then later brilliantly packaged into a brand name by the Situationist International. What I mean by scientific management includes tight accounting, uh, standardization, time and motion studies, clocks, time clocks, and forms of rationalization that invariably meant an increase in the intensity of labor. Now, there's no A to B in how these strands transformed into, or you might more charitably say were replaced by the ideology and practice of the beauty of labor in the National Socialist Dictatorship. Sometimes the link is clear, as in some personal trajectories, like Wilhelm Lertz, who had been an editor of Die Forma, a Werkbund Bauhaus organ, became the editor of Schonheit der Arbeit, or the practitioner Fritz Gies, a professor in Stuttgart. Gies had made his name with his Girl Kultur, an analysis of the Tiller Girls, a not sexy but highly synchronized high-kicking dance troupe, when what was American and identified with Taylorism, precision and efficiency, was what acquired to. But he also became a national socialist enthusiast. These personal changes reflect in part the turn against Americanism that existed at a rhetorical level before 1929, before the 1929 crash, but obviously gained traction from it. They also have continuity in what I will call the aestheticization of the workplace by professionals, architects and designers to the fore. In what was both a bogus and real conflict between Americanism and the Germanic that ran through the Weimar period, Walter Gropius in particular was an enthusiast for American models, even while he still talked of the spirit of a whole people, feet in both camps, when a nationalist rhetoric talked precisely of the spiritualization of labor. It was also a period of competing professionalizations, which, whatever their nominal politics, developed and in some cases created career and status interests that were inherently managerial in relation to the working class. Engineers, architects, industrial psychologists and sociologists like Geese competed and or collaborated, united in what I will call productionism, or professionally Arbeitwissenschaft, if I've pronounced that correctly. That is, getting the best results, the best performance from workers in industry or those who service them. Gropius, following Behrens, was influenced by American-style factory building and the lighted aloud, which, as the narrator of the Consequences film says, was good for the workers' productivity and functioning health and good for the surveillance of the worker. The surveillance of the worker being a goal perfected by the Taylorist professionals. In the case of Geese, light was not a noted factor in his study of the women telephone operators at the Berlin Exchange. In this, he rather more followed Hugo Munsterberg, who is recognized as a father of what became known as psychotechnics, uh, claiming yet one more third way. Uh, the number of third ways that have been in the, the 20th century are quite extraordinary. They're still going on. Uh, a third way, in his case, between reckless capitalism and feeble sentimentality. Uh, with the phrase feeble sentimentality is, of course, really loading the dice here. And this was in a 1913 book, Psychology and Industrial Efficiency. 
And based at Harvard, Munsterberg's own study was prompted by a telephonist strike in Toronto. And Geese, in the early 1920s, followed a similar strike in Berlin by telephonists that had cut off the city and was saved only by a government-loyal military telegraph unit. So as reactions to strikes, investigations into the work itself could only be in the interests of management. As a true Taylorist, Geese's analysis begins with breaking down the process of the telephonist's work into 20 different elements, such as visual recognition of an incoming call and inserting the jack in the right place, and then calculating the time of each movement. From this, the psychophysical profile of each process was established, and from this, norms were created, both for selecting candidates and for improving the performance of those already working there. To take a step back, the basics of what I'm calling scientific management, some already in existence, had been synthesized, uh, again, a good piece of PR, by the American F.W. Taylor in his book of the same name, uh, Scientific Management, that came out in 1903. This is many years before the Weimar Republic, obviously. As a flag flown by some German managers, it was an integral part of Americanism. In it, Taylor describes a worker both as an intelligent guerrilla and unwittingly endorsing the worker gorilla's intelligence as one who deliberately plans to do as little as he safely can. Taylor, the productionist, set out to put a stop to this by breaking down work into discrete actions so that the work of skilled factory craftsmen would be de-skilled. What are called time and motion studies, furthering the one-sided division of labor. In addition, with the new de-skilled processes designed, the pace was to be set by the fastest man. This, however, was a very old science derived, and here we can talk of an A to B connection. This came directly from the slave plantation system. Some years later, in 1913, while architects like Gropius were pushing for status recognition in the Deutsche Werkbund and designing the new factories, two major strikes took place in Europe and both were defeated. At Renault Biancourt in France, it was specifically against the use of time and motion studies, work with understanding that they were aimed at both de skilling and the speed up of work. In the same year, a strike at Bosch, here in Stuttgart, where the orphaned Oskar Schlemmer was fending for himself, Bosch started to make redundancies of those who couldn't keep up the pace. Piecework, that is to say the wage set tightly to production time targets and the timing of processes had been introduced soon after Taylor's book had come out. Uh, Bosch's marketing director, Hugo Borst, met Taylor himself in the year of the strike and, until 1926, was a chief propagandist for Taylorism in Germany. At the same time, the workers' slogan was, peace work is murder. It's not, only the way of effect it's not the only way of affecting the speed up of work, but it's the most individually controllable and was murderously imposed in the chemical industry by Carl Duisberg of Bayer and instigator of the process of cartelization that became E.G. Farben, while, while at the same time he re rhetorically eschewed anything American and talked of German work as if it was an ethnic speciality. So with piecework, you have a situation where in the mechanized factory, which became common in 19th century, is continued into our own speed up, which is the basis of what Marx calls the intensity of labor. It would work somewhat like the meat stockyard in Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, which is set in the 
Chicago stockyards at the beginning of the 20th century. He says, he writes in the novel, the speeding up seemed to be growing more savage all the time. They were continually inventing new devices to crowd the work on. It was for all the world like the thumbscrew of the medieval torture chamber. They would get new pacemakers and pay them more, and they would drive the men on with new machinery. It was said that in the hog-killing rooms, the speed at which the hogs moved was determined by clockwork, and that it was increased a little every day. In piecework, they would reduce the time requiring the same work in a shorter time and paying the same wage. And then, after the worker had accustomed themselves to the new speed, they would reduce the rate of payment to correspond with the reduction in time. In the old and new worlds, it can break the body, as with the Lancashire mule spinners in late 19th century America, or the seamstresses in a modern day Mexican maquiladora for whom seven years is the maximum for a job. I mean, they're exhausted after seven, really physically exhausted after seven years. Uh, and in these maculadora, this is where the system is really sophisticated and the work of each individual worker is constantly monitored both for speed and mistakes. Now, against this, in this professional world that I'm trying to describe, there was and had been since earlier in the 19th century when the metaphor of the human motor first appeared, a science of energetics based on a further metaphor taken from thermodynamics whereby entropy became the notion of fatigue. Now, I think that such metaphors from the natural sciences into the social sciences are invariably either useless or deceptive. But, nevertheless, it established itself as a professional area of study, energetics. In it, fatigue was perceived as the limiting factor to productionism. It was recognised also that the, that, that, um, on, that the concentration on detail brought about by the ever-increasing division of labour meant that attention, conscientiousness and duration of performance were what mattered and that fatigue was a potential threat to these. As with other managerial stands, fatigue experts in nutrition and physiology sought to provide a neutral, objective solution to economic and political conflicts. As the modern Mexican example indicates, this assumes that people are not dispensable. And there was a distinctly humanist element in, a, in energetics, in that it was less short-termist than Taylorism in terms of the working life. It was, however, the, the working class itself and not energetics professionals that fought long fights for an eight-hour working day across Europe. And where it was one, however, scientific management became even more important with the need to extract maximum man-hour production. This humanist element in energetics was also undermined twice over by its place in the 1914-18 war, which saw its status established in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Labour Physiology. And it was then that energetics slipped into becoming more the psychotechnical works of aptitude testing. This involved, too, as one of its proponents, uh, Josefa Lotieco, uh, accepted a cautious acceptance of Taylorism in the belief that yet, no, yet another European third way could come of it and that the principle of the most apt would in fact promise greater social equality. A darker version was expressed by Max Weber and the Verein for Socialpolitique, one of the many think tanks of the period, of the Weimar period, competing for attention and status. His prediction that the working human being will be as carefully calculated as to his profitability as any raw material or coal on terms of its usefulness
for the plant. And this to be done so that the question of who shared in the profitability, the distribution of the surplus, was to be rendered unprofessional. The Varine's interest in the selection and adaptation was in the spirit of psychotechnics. Munsterberg's supposed humanising of Taylorism, which had, he claimed, failed to consider the subjective experience of workers. But what this interest in the subjective experience of workers produced in reality was a sophisticated version of Taylorism concerned with adaptation, motivation, and job, in inverted commas, satisfaction. So Gies, the professor from Stuttgart, in his study of the processes of the telephonist's work, moved on from an analysis of the actions involved in the performance, in the process of the work, and then started to talk of a tailorization of the body and the creation of internalized discipline by a device called a self-registering attention measuring apparatus, whereby via wires attached to the telephonist's fingers, she could see her own performance on the screen. Now, the telephonist accepted the rationale of time and motion studies in a period where there was a, a, an active and believable discourse of liberatory social reconstruction. It was articulated by Gustav Bauer, Minister of Labour from 1920, where he talks of Taylorism as an instrument of national liberation in the hands of a democratic and necessarily socialist state. But the Social Democrats did not fully control the state nor economic restructuring. And in these circumstances, I would argue it was quite the reverse. The telephonists understood this and resisted from the moment that, this, that the work of um, Geese uh, was leading to job-cutting rationalization during the fiscal crisis of 1923 to 24. Their leader, the leader of the telephonist, one Elsa Colshorn, was clear that over-rationalisation was being used in the service of a more politically pliable workforce. And by 1926, the telephonist directly opposed any psychotechnical aptitude testing. Now, Gustav Bauer was not alone in what I, I would call a dangerous illusion of productionism. Taylorism was being fetishized in the USSR at the same time and articulated by the Central Institute of Work and theorized by A.K. Gastev. And this is what constantly hindered the Communist Party of Germany in their critiques of scientific management in practice. They understood that its aim was to increase the intensity of labour, that is to say more work done in a given time, to the detriment of the workers' health and workplace power. But they were all for efficiency at the same time. So the KPD, constant supporters of the Bauhaus and in the Weimar days of Gropius, I'm sorry, I misread that, uh, so this, the, 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 the fact that the, that the USSR are, are fanatical Taylorists actually impedes the KPD in its criticism of what is actually happening. And they, of course, the KPD were consistent supporters of the Bauhaus. And in the Weimar days, Gropius himself was accused of being a Bolshevik. Now, if by this, if this insult... Uh, ironic for uh, a war hero and a man with a private income. If by this, being a Bolshevik is meant Jacobin managerialist, then for Gropius the cap does fit. This dilemma for the Communist Party was articulated in the politics around the decision to give public money to the RKW, uh, in English the National Board of Efficiency, and excuse my pronunciation, the Reich's Curatorium for Wirtschaftlichkeit, 
uh, which the KPD unsuccessfully opposed. They, they opposed its creation because the RKW was like so many of the power centres in today's world, was successfully ambiguous as a public-private organisation. Set up originally in 1921 by Carl von Siemens and then effectively run by his deputy, Carl Gottgen, and it had government representatives, including Social Democrats, including Rudolf Hilferding, but there were no trade unionists. The KPD, understandably, wanted direct government institution if there was, for the aim of productive efficiency. But instead, the grey area of the RKW, this grey public-private grey area, became and it became the main inst institution of psychotechnics in the service of increased productivity and exports, setting up a series of aptitude testing stations. Kurtgen went to the USA, and while pointing to the USA's natural resources advantage over Germany, extolled the standardization of production and the greater intensity of labor he found. At this time, I think it was in, in fact in 1926, Henry Ford's autobiography appeared and in different ways appealed across the political spectrum. His authoritarianism and anti-Semitism on one side and the efficiency of his production methods to different degrees to both sides. In 1926, the Social Museum in Frankfurt held a conference for industrial psychologists and sociologists as well as entrepreneurs, entitled Ford and Us. In a 1926 essay, the economist Friedrich von Gotten Ottenfield elaborated on how the Taylor system was only one way of reaching maximum performance. That is meant only for application to single plants that have already been established. And he contrasted with this with how the creativity of Fordist methods is manifest in the level of immense system of plants taken together in which productive functions be organized into an ideal succession. And it's true, the production levels of Ford in America were staggering compared to any other process. Why be poor was a slogan of the pro-Fordist social democrats. Even when one of them, Tony Sender, reported of a visit to a Ford factory that he had never seen men in a factory with such tense features, one is shocked by the expression of unspeakable tiredness. While saying this, he at the same time dismisses opposition to the Ford process as Luddite and declares it would be fine if only a few social protections were applied. Fordism then was presented as optimization rather than the maximization of Taylorism. Right. Now these debates, and there were many debates, there were journals, think tanks, debates, professional institutions, I think all vying, as I said at the beginning, for status and position. And these debates, particularly on Americanism, coincided with the fact that despite reparations, and the reparations discourse, there was a huge inflow of capital into Germany, especially from the United States. But German capital rejected Fordism as such, associating it with job mobility and too high wage levels. Instead, German industry was modernized without mass production and mass consumption, increased productivity without massive technological investment. This, again, is not exclusive to the period, nor indeed its generic past. Michel Salvati has described a process of rationalization without investment in 1960s Italy. In the Weimar Republic, an industrial like Karl Duisberg had, had used Taylorist methods without any acknowledgement of Americanism, indeed, which he rhetorically opposed, or indeed the word itself. He had, after all, been lecturing the Americans on the dangers of organized labor back in 1903. 
I will focus briefly on this individual, Carl Duisberg of Bayer, again as representing what managerial social democracy and the technocratic, technocratic belief that they were creating a world in which caste conflict would be a thing of the past was resolutely blind to. They simply did not take on board the capitalism represented by Duisberg. They were just blind to this notion that class conflict could be a thing of the past. For Duisberg, cartelization was capitalist this is rationalization. So this is another version of rationalization. And rationalization is the creation of cartels. Well, for him, factory efficient efficiency was uh, piecework, low pay, and fearsome discipline. As a key member of the Association of German Industrialists, interclass cooperation meant, in fact, lower taxes, decreased welfare spending, and longer, more flexible work hours. At the same time, Duisberg, who had used French occupying troops to break strikes in 1919, was a self-proclaimed German nationalist who, in 1926, declared to the Association, in work, and in joy of work lies the true meaning of life. This blindness to the realities of German capital continued with other strands of overtly reactionary managerialism, which nevertheless had in common the overcoming of the very idea as well as the realities of class conflict. If for those who presented themselves as progressive modernists, such conflict was simply not necessary, irrational, and could be overcome by technical solutions, these other strands perceived, uh, perceived that the very notion of a proletariat to be dangerous and somehow alien to German culture. They used a radical reactionary critique of the alienation of the worker in the world of scientific management, promising a return of a higher sense of purpose to labor. At a Deutsche Werkbund meeting in 1924, Borsch, the tailorist of, um, of the Siemens company and the RKW, was opposed by one Willy Hellpack who wanted to spiritualize of the industrial work and talked of the overcoming of materialist attitudes by German values. Elsewhere, the Catholic industrial sociologist Gerd Briefs argued that the industrial plant itself was and should be an isolated social sphere which could and should be organized in lines with demands for discipline, adaptation and hierarchy. These strands were institutionalized in the DINTA, the DINTA, the German Institute for Technical Labor Training, an activist think tank set up in 1925 by engineers who, though given a definite role by Taylorism, had themselves been rather overproduced uh, in technical universities and were thwarted in ambition and very much in search of professional status. Uh, here, my lack of German really lets me down, but two reliable historians speak of a fusion of German romanticism with a cult of techniques in the journals of its professional association, the Engineers Professional Association, the VDL, called Technology and Culture. Dinter itself was blessed and flattered by Oswald Spengler, was rhetorically anti-American and picked up on the spiritualization of work implicit, implicit in Heidegger. To complete the circle, Gies, the professor from Stuttgart, analyst of the Tiller Girls and Berlin's telephonist, joined Dinter in 1928. While the Social Democrat unions were content with industry-wide negotiation, Dinter worked at individual plant level. While emphasizing the Taylorist emphasis on individual performance, it worked on the bonding of the worker to the firm. 
in which the engineer would replace the industrialist so that the artisan would not learn his skill from other artisans but be trained by the engineer for the firm's particular needs. Its programs deliberately segregated young works from the potentially dangerous influence of older workers. And most of all, the firm became the center of a world with company schools and sport clubs that would recreate a sense of mission, a sense of belonging, and a concept of honor. Now, all this has come to be defined by historians as reactionary modernism. So what then to get finally to the point of what might be called the progressive modernism Bauhaus in the context of these many strands in Weimar concerned in their different ways with rationalization and performance, the many faces of managerialism, all believing that they could solve what they perceived as the problem of class conflict. All, again, in their different ways, believing in a vertically stratified organization of work and decision-making and in the instilling of new social and work habits on those below. I will argue that even though Gropius especially managed to keep or allow autonomous and not immediately workshops in the Bauhaus school, like that of the women-dominated weaving workshop, to flourish, the dominant discourse and practice of Bauhaus is that of the architect and the subsidiary all-purpose designer. A more hard-line interpretation would be that Bauhaus tested all the contributions of the avant-garde in terms of the needs of capitalist-determined production. If the engineers were concerned with their status and an ideology supported, it's even more true of the architect who shifts from being an aesthete to a reformer, who democratizes good taste and then in the words of Gropius' successor, Hannes Meyer, to being a specialist in organization. As such specialists, they too take up scientific management with enthusiasm. One of the uh, offshoots of the RKW, the National Board of Efficiency, was an institute for work time determination. Gropius was a fan, writing in 1927 of the need for the determination of the expenditure of time and energy for each individual part of the production process during the manufacture and assembly of buildings and for the preparation of flow charts of work on the site according to scientific business principles. To this end, he and his colleagues introduced time and motion studies, time and motion studies being what workers from telephonists and metal industries had come to mistrust, on the Dassau and Braunheim housing projects. These studies used 16 millimeter film invented in 1921 and stopwatches to examine the work. I mean, this is really sophisticated for the time, time and motion study. While at the same time, with the support of the Weimar bureaucracy, their architects succeeded in controlling the key support structures, such as sources of sponsorship, as with the Dassau project. Gropius himself was an enabler of such money as vice president of the National Society for Research into Economic Building and Housing. I'm coming to the end now, so just to reassure you. Uh, on the other side, the building themselves, just as the modernist architects had introduced factories full of natural light as functional to production, a similar approach applied to worker housing. Thus, as far back as 1911, in the days of the Werkbund, Gropius was writing that a worker will find that a room well thought out by artists, which responds to the sense of beauty we all possess, will, relive, will relieve the monotony of the daily task and he will be more willing to join the common enterprise if the worker is happy, he will take more pleasure in his work and the productivity of the firm will increase. This is functionalism. 
The sense of beauty we all possess has a democratic ring to it, but it has to be in the hands of the professionals, those of design, design for living. As for the common enterprise and the productivity of the firm, it could be the language of Dinter, the reactionary modernists. Where it is different is its reflection of the social democratic nexus, the social democratic, I think, illusory contract. That the loss of the workers' power in work would be compensated by increased consumption. Manfredo Tafuri argued that this is reflected in the Bauhaus by Gropius's refusal to have a history course at the school. And this, Tafuri arguments, is a belief in the permanent present, and the permanent present being that essential component of the society of the spectacle as theorised by Guy Debord and the situationists in the 1960s. In the present of Weimar, however, German capital, as characterised by Karl Duisberg, who, if he was alive today, I'm sure would be rejoicing that Bayer uh, had taken over, um, what's the terrible seed company called? Thank you, that Bayer had taken over Monsanto, he would be absolutely delighted. Uh, so, as I said, in the present of Weimar, German capital, as characterised by Diceberg, was hostile to a high-wage mass consumption economy. And this means that the social democratic and progressive managerialist deal was inherently fragile. As I said at the beginning of this talk, there's no A to B from Weimar to the nationalist socialist, the national socialist ideology of the beauty of labor when the unity of the whole people and its spirit, a language which Gropius used throughout the Weimar period, was then imposed by force. We now have a violently authoritarian model of the unity of the whole people. This model did, however, uh, this, this model did, however, have a place for various strands of scientific management, even if its science of energetics became a racially, uh, a racially defined hierarchy of nutritional levels. Psychotechnics, for example, had to wait for the National Socialist dictatorship to have its own institution, its own institute. When the study of aptness for the job became primarily concerned with identifying potential subversives and slackers, continuing what Detlef Poikert calls a paradigm shift in human sciences, which saw the replacement of rationalization discourse by selection discourse. The Deutsche Industry Norman, whose measures of standardization had been adopted by the Bauhaus in 1925, was made, by comprehen was made comprehensive by Ernst Neufer, an architect who had worked with Gropius uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the same period. Indeed, by the mid-1930s, when the regime, the National Socialist regime, ad abandoned its tradition flim-flam, leaving artists as various as Emil von Older and Rudolf von Laben out in the cold, suddenly national socialists who are suddenly degenerates. This is because productionism, productivity and efficiency resumed its primacy, this time under the banner of the beauty of labour. If in the Weimar period trade unions had dangerously ignored the class impact of industrial rationalisation, now they were banned altogether. But there is another continuity, and it's shown in this poster made by Herbert Bayer, who we heard a lot about this morning. Uh, I, I was actually surprised that this poster didn't come into that talk, because this is 1938, uh, and it's quite speci a, a German-speaking comrade tried to rationalize this poster by saying it was, it was ironic. Well, I can see no evidence of it being ironic because an essential part of national socialist productionism was to make factories look good, clean and neat. 
The external appearance of more than 12,000 industrial plants were improved, rubble removed, lawns and parks created, just as in the poster. It would, it was argued, return to the worker a feeling of the worth and importance of his labour. Intensive work on model designs for offices, canteens and workrooms were instituted and designs for furniture, light fittings and other furnishings completed. Now perhaps, because the beauty of labour is a national socialist enterprise, it can be dismissed as inherently kitsch. I don't know. But it seems to me that it's very much in the spirit of Bauhaus, the ace the aestheticization of alienated labour. More than that, with the extension of modern design, which is the watchword of both the Deutsche Werkbund and the Bauhaus, when in the hands of authoritative design professionals, to all aspects, when they when the design professionals could apply it to all aspects of everyday life, social relations were mediated by an image of the world derived from technical rationality. Technical rationality, as we well know, that could be at the service of the irrational as well as anything else, and still is. Thank you. <laughs>